perspective that the corporate bodies like uh, Lilly Foundation, this company that manufactures diabetes drugs and so on, has just given that university the equivalent of, um, and not the equivalent, but has given them 200 million US dollars uh, to put up a hotel facility as an income generating, but with Christian values, just outside, just across the road from the president's office. And you see, it is by creating such human beings, uh, universities like Daystar, Taylor, Wheaton, uh, Bethel, that uh, the world will be different as we move into the future. So there was a lot on integration of faith. Um, I'm glad what I've been trying to do with you um, kind of measured to what integration of faith is. But I've also learned a lot from the presentations and the group discussions on how to enhance that in my university. So we are having um, a very important meeting of the university on uh, on Monday, it was supposed to be Wednesday, but I moved it to, to Monday, where one of the major topics is integration of faith into teaching. And then after that, uh, I threw our chancellor, I was invited to meet two donors, and I flew to uh, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, Massachusetts, you know, is the, the, I don't know how, is is the bastion of knowledge in the US. So you have Boston, and then across the river, you have Cambridge, uh, two major regions. And in Boston, you have all the universities, Boston itself, uh, and many of the top world universities. And then in Cambridge, you have MIT, uh, had the, the to be donned an MIT T-shirt. Then I went to uh, further down is Harvard. They are all found in the state of Massachusetts, plus other other universities. And uh, I managed to to look at the library at Harvard, and uh, uh, I've gotten some volumes for our school of law uh, that relate to Commonwealth uh, laws. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, and uh, in Boston, then I met uh, two major funders and uh, I tried to convince them about our university, and we are hoping that uh, uh, they will ask us to submit a proposal. Uh, most of the big funders, you don't go and tell them, I want this. No, no, no. You go and tell them who you are and what you are doing, and... Uh, you don't even express your needs. You just show them what you are doing and where you are going. And then one of the biggest things that comes out of such a discussion is when somebody tells you, we are going to, based on what you have told us and what we have seen in the videos and so on, and the website, uh, you should hear from us asking you to submit a proposal. You don't just write. If you send them anything, they'll just throw it in the trash. So they are the ones to to ask you to submit a proposal. And so we are hoping that, uh, not we are hoping, I'm very positive that uh, we'll, we'll get uh, uh, the support God knows we need uh, for our upcoming uh, learning complex that will house the School of Law and perhaps other things. Um, of course, Taylor University has now become a great friend they are in the process of uh, giving us uh, a huge co uh, consignment of laptops for, for the university facilities, library facilities. Having said that, um, Caro, I wanted to share uh, something here and uh, I'm hoping I can share it um, 
Yes, mm. yes, Prof. It's, it's, it's uh, if management. you'll allow me to share it. Um, so our devotion, because of time, will be very brief. But uh, I know I've not yet started sharing, but uh, I wanted to share this him and then briefly close it up because I have a lot of work I want to cover with you. Uh, let me try to see. And uh, there is uh, there is a, a lyric line being put at the end of the, at, below the video. Try to to get it, but we all know this song. I want us to listen to it. Is it visible, Carol? Yes, it's visible. Uh, you can play. Uh, you want to share the sounds, Prof? Uh, that's uh, what I'll let, let me make a host. I don't know if that will help you. On there? Um, uh, maybe I was what you can do on the site on, on more, then you say sh you share sounds. On, on your right. Mm, just a minute. On, on your right on the on the zoom, on the zoom part. Not not YouTube, okay. on the zoom part. Okay. Mm. Down, oh, down on Zoom buzz where you have the store, participants, chat, screen, notes, and then more, and then you can say, share sound. Just to I'm trying to see where the share sound, share computer sound. Eh? Yes, 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 bro. Is it share sound or share computer sound? Uh, share, share mm. sound or is it computer? But that's okay if it's you go to the computer sound. It's the computer that's sound. fine. Okay. Is it coming through? Yes. Oh. You can hear. Oh 
to just to sorry about that I would like to emphasize uh, I know many of us know this uh, thing uh, but uh, it has special significance uh, when we we are called upon to crown him. And uh, I was reading my devotion this morning, and uh, I, I I just wondered to myself, what would be the greatest legacy that one can live on this earth? And uh, I wanted to share this with you, and please bear in mind the the song that we have just listened to uh because uh, if all of us uh crowned him uh, then we would leave beautiful legacies on this earth And uh, I I am going to ask uh, Evans Lusasi to first of all read us the verse. The verse reading is Deuteronomy chapter thirty four, verse four to five. I hope I hope you are able to read it. Is it too small? No, uh, it's okay. It's fine. Okay. Okay. So read us the opening verse only. Okay. Uh, this should be around verse four. And then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on earth to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. <clears throat> Sorry. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. That's Deuteronomy 34, 
verse four to five. Yes. Um, this is this is the Lord to Moses. This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over it. I think what is significant here is that um, we are on a journey on this earth. And sometimes we are consumed with uh, self-glorification, uh, desire for all things, and we forget that what is very, very important is the legacy that you leave behind. And, and that transition statement, I'll give it to your descendants. So what you should be asking yourself is, if, if you put yourself What legacy will you give to your descendants? To your country, Kenya? To your family, your children, to your grandchildren? To generations to come? To the world? So I would like um, Sylvanas Getaria, are you able to Start us with reading. We just we read very short paragraphs. So you read us those first two paragraphs on legacies. Okay, Based thank you. Legacies. One February, one February day in Ireland in the 18th, John de Esther was killed in a duel, leaving an 18-year-old widow named Jane. With little money and past due bills, the, bail, the bailiffs came to save their property and threatened to return to sell her husband's body to the mortuary. Jane took her husband's body and buried it in an unmarked grave. Then she, she fled to a village on the Scottish-English border. One day, feeling despondent, Jane sat beside the river and contemplated suicide. Just then, Jane heard whistling. A young plowman known as Hem Whistler had begun work in the fields. Jane was touched. She thought of her two small children who needed her. She was healthy and had her whole life before her. If a man plowing fields could whistle, she could keep going. So she returned to Dublin Shortly afterwards, she, att uh, she attended St. George's Church and trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. God gave her an unusual burden to pray earnestly for the children and the 12 generations to follow, desiring to leave a spiritual legacy. Pause. God gave her an unusual burden to pray honestly for her children and the 12 generations to follow, desiring to leave a spiritual legacy. And I want you to contextualize this into our situation. Uh, whatever vocation you are engaged in, uh, here, Jane's burden was to pray. Your burden is to teach. Your burden is to uphold laws. Your burden is to enhance the well-being of vulnerable in society. And, and, and really, we would like to see that legacy perpetuated through 12 generations, because you are here on this earth. Yes. Eugene Situma. Read. 
read us the next paragraph. Thank you, Prof. Eugene, good evening, colleagues. Good evening, yes. Jane later married a wealthy man named Captain John Guinness and continued in prayer. Her son, Gretan, became a minister. His preaching helped trigger the 1859 Irish revival where up to 100,000 people came to Christ in one year. Generations later, Dr. O.S. Guinness, son of Chinese missionaries, gained worldwide acclaim as Christ's spokesman. Though she didn't live to see all the results of her many prayers, Jen left an incredible legacy. Yes, I, 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 and colleagues, I am talking about you, you intend to leave. Incredible legacy. I hope you have heard of... Uh, uh, Dr. O.S. Guinness. You can see this is the same, the 12th, through the 12 generations. Obadia, Bazihire, are you there? Yes, if, Yeah, please read us the next the second last paragraph. For 40 years, Moses faithfully served God. He nurtured the promise planted centuries early that his people would live in their own land and worship the one true God. Through Moses, uh, though Moses had a moment of defiance, when he stuck the rock, he was still allowed to see the promised land. His legacy, he recorded God's law for posterity. He led God's people to freedom, all the way to the blink of the promised land. Yes. I, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's pause. Though Moses had a moment of defiance, you remember when he struck the rock in anger, he was still allowed to see the promised land. In other words, we have human uh iniquities and uh, weaknesses. But what was Moses' legacy? He recorded God's laws for prosperity. He led God's to freedom all the way, all the way to the brink of the promised land. I, I want us to, I'm talking about legacies. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, and today my focus is on gentlemen. And the biggest legacy you leave on this earth is your influence on fellow human beings. Just remember that. Not the skyscrapers, not the, the earthly world. No. The biggest legacy will be when you influence fellow human beings in terms of values, in terms of character, in terms of knowledge, in terms of adherence and devotion to scripture. And so that even if, and by the way, none of us in brackets will reach the promised land Think about it. But you'll fade away and a new generation will be born. But what they will encounter, either deliberately or not, is your influence. And, and really this should be the case. And, and I'm hoping that 
many of us have come for this course because you want to build a legacy. That this empowerment will allow you to build a bigger legacy that you'll leave behind. You could be the first master's graduate in your family line. That is a legacy. You, who will influence other human beings and it will be said of you that realize, even if your grave is unmarked, you know, you don't have to lie in a asylum. No, you can be in an unmarked grave. Like some of us, I come from a family where, through my ancestors, we don't cement graves in my family. And I have no issues. So when we die, we, we you are just taken back to the soil. So we will not put concrete and uh, mesh wire and mabatis and uh, mixed concrete. No, you know, will just be buried in a, in a coffin that will not be painted white. It will be a wooden coffin, simple, with vanish. You know, your legacy will not be that you are buried in a concrete, a concreted uh, grave. Or you are buried in the mess in the best uh what what do you call them langatas of this world. It is the influence you'll have made on fellow human beings. Uh Chris Wakesa, finish for us the reading. <clears throat> you may not be a Moses leading a nation out of bondage. Let's start again. You are off. Start again. Okay. Uh, you may not be a Moses leading a nation out of bondage, but like Jane Guinness, you can live a spiritual heritage. The most powerful instrument at your disposal is prayer. No matter what your spiritual uh, situation in life, no matter what your gifts or talents, you can pray for others. You can live a beautiful legacy, asking God that those who follow after you will impact the world for Christ. Reflection. Yeah, no, no, just stop there. So uh, you can leave behind a beautiful legacy that those fo who follow after you will impact the world for Christ. And you know what Christ is all about. It's about all those things. It's about compassion. It's about kindness. It's about love. It's about caring. It's about reverence for God. If you left that behind, you leave behind 12 generations plus who will have become better because you lived on this earth. And that is my prayer for you. Uh, I'll be posting this uh, through uh, your portals. And uh, here I would just like Meshach Sindani, if you could just, we're not answering these questions because I had wanted us to discuss, but just read them. And this one, uh, juggle with them on your in your mind. And uh, it's not an assignment, but it is an assignment. Sindani, Meshach. Yes, Prof. Uh, the reflection? Yes. Okay. Reflection number one. Put yourself in Moses' shoes. Do you think he was satisfied with his legacy? Why or why not? Reflection number two. Who are you responsible for leading at home? Work or church? Who are you responsible for leading at home? Work or church? Reflection number three, pray that you will leave a spiritual legacy in your wake. 
that those who follow after you will tell others about Jesus Christ. Yes. And so my prayer is that all of us, me included, will leave behind a spiritual legacy. A spiritual legacy just means striving to be Christ-like. So even in your teaching, even in your role as a psychologist, even as a business person, even as a, a church minister, even as a lawyer, a legal mind, a spiritual legacy means you have impacted on people to never be the same again in values, in their character, and in their spirituality. That really is my prayer for you. Uh, I would like to request uh, then um, very quickly um, Charles Manyara, if you're there, uh, please pray for us that we may be men and women who leave behind a legacy. We can pray. Lord, we come before you this fine evening to give thanks and glory unto your name for the good care we have taken of us. As we embark on today's classes, we ask for your gift of wisdom and blessings. For in Jesus' holy name, we do pray and trust. Amen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so that is our devotion. And uh, this, this thing of integration of faith, uh, that is the difference that actually makes you the better professional you want to become. Um, so I want us to go back to what we were doing last time. And uh, I'm very excited that uh, I threw Nimerusha Kamba na Nimeona ya kwamba wengi wetu may may shika hiyo kamba kweli kweli uh, that is my my delight uh, that you have really i threw a kamba and uh, when i asked how are the library classes and all of you said they are just beautiful. So, you know, I am supposed to teach uh, referencing in this course as I'm winding up my chapter three to now start your helping you with proposals. But now I'll not teach, I'll just give an exam, uh, a multiple choice exam on uh, referencing, on data mining, using the library, how beautiful it is. And Carol, that was ingenious for you to, to tell the library to do this for me. So, so next week, once they finish, we shall have a, a, a quiz. On that, those whole, that whole area of APA version 7, edition number 7, and how to use the library. Uh, then I'll be convinced you know, because now I will not do it. If, I'm, if I did it, I'll be abusing your intelligence, because you already have said you have uh, uh, learned that. Uh, are we still there? Yes, 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 we are. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted. You know, that's that's one of the best things that has happened. You know, last night I was so low. Liverpool was ashamed. So now I'm so delighted. I have my turn to, uh, 
to laugh. Uh, let us go to data collection. <laughs> uh, Prof, so, you know, so you know, you are Liverpool. Yeah, I'm Liverpool. Uh, uh, for generations. Yeah, so I'm very. I hope you avoid football. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm so happy because uh, APS styling, formatting, data mining. Uh, accessing our life. By the way, we are really privileged, and uh, I wish I was not the VC talking, but you have a library. You can I access my library anywhere in the world, wherever I am. I I use the library. Uh, I have very friendly staff. Uh, you know uh, the librarian, the university librarian, the acting one. I just send them. I want this much or minutes. I have it. So the, you have the world is at your hands. But I want to know whether you have learned how to use that library. That's why I'm very, very excited. Uh, uh, I'm very, very excited about the good comments I've had. So we are doing data collection. Uh, remember, after uh, doing sampling, uh, you have to collect the data. Um, and there are many ways of collecting data as you go to the field. And, and uh, I just want to expose you. Uh, again, my work is not for you to memorize anything. It's just to comprehend. That's why after, after this, I'll give you a handout on this whole area of data collection. I will touch that analysis, but uh, I know that my namesake, Laban, is, is dealing with the statistics. So I'm not getting, but I'll try to relate the theory of statistics with application when you're writing your, your work. So, um, that the data collection, requires rigorous and uh, systematic design and execution. So you must have a plan for data collection. You need to plan, I'll go and collect data in schools in my county. But how will I collect the data? Whom will I collect the data from? How do I ensure that the sample I collect is representative of the population so as to overcome sampling error? And you know that the sampling error would uh, nullify the validity of your findings. There is this thing called piloting in data collection. There is this aspect called piloting in data collection. Uh, you must pilot. And what will you be piloting? You'll be piloting the questionnaires, or let me call them the instruments. So they will be piloting. There will be weighed modification after the pilot. Uh, so the pilot will tell you this question. Every time you ask this question to the science teachers, it was ambiguous. They were not clear. So you have to modify that question. When I approached the pastors about the burden of uh, mental health in their church, they did not understand the scope of mental health. So I'll have to go and modify, and it is weighed modification. And then you will deliberately go out and implement the data collection process and execute it 
as per the design. After that, there will be appropriate management of the data you will have collected and you will do the necessary data analysis. If it is qualitative, uh, you'll use the appropriate software. If it is quantitative, you'll use the appropriate software and then you will discuss those results. Collection process is has a systematic design, but it has to be rigorous. Otherwise, you'll be collecting data that is not valid. Now, in data collection, let me just amplify this. In data collection, sorry, we do surveys. Surveys is, involves gathering information from individuals using a questionnaire. So don't start imagining, what is a survey? Is it a survey of Kenya? Is it where? What type of, what is this monster called survey? Surveys is just the information you gather from individuals using a tool called a questionnaire. And surveys can reach a large number of respondents. So you can do a survey in, in data of all first years who are doing ICT, who are doing computer science. Or you can do a survey of all the students in the School of Law at Daystar. And surveys generate standardized, quantifiable, empirical data. But also you can get some qualitative data, depending on the questionnaire. So we, we can get, if this study was quantitative, we can still do survey and get standardized, quantifiable, empirical data. But if the study was qualitative, we can also get qualitative data. And we shall be going into that uh, themes, you know, categorization, then themes, ETC. And if the study was a mixed method, then you'd be looking for both types. Surveys can and offer confidentiality and anonymity. So there's the ethics of research where we'll mention when we start doing the proposals that it is important for you to read around the ethics of research and know who to collect data from and maintain confidentiality and also freedom for them to fill your survey tool or not. Um, I think this is very important. Designing survey instruments is capable of generating credible data, however, can be difficult. This is my advice to all of you. Avoid as much as possible trying to design a survey instrument to collect data as much as possible. In other words, I'm saying at master's level, kidogo badu ko hafifu. Kidogo ujapata ile hali ya uzoefu ya mienendo ya utafiti. So kidogo kubali ya kwamba mtajifunza kwa wengine ambao walinitangulia and and so i'll be encouraging my students particularly the ones that are supervised that uh, we shall use what i'll call validated 
we will use instruments that have already their validity and reliability has already been established. If you try to do instruments like when I was when I went to Moi, and uh, we would start uh, developing what is called discipline inquiry, you are supposed to go out in the field, and you find somebody has said my questionnaire is ready. I'm going to collect data. When I looked at the content validity of the questionnaire, the construct validity of the questionnaire. I would I would shudder. What are you going to collect? What you think you're going to collect, you cannot collect using this instrument. So I am cautioning all of you that uh, in matters of the instruments you'll use, uh, I hope the library, I don't want to interfere with what the library has taught you, but uh, there are tools, the Survey Monkey and the others, where through it we can we can get very valid and then we can adapt those tools we can adapt those tools the word they used is uh, we can do modified standardization of those tools and then make sure that we get the valid results that we are looking for so we are talking about the Cronbach's alpha in statistics which establishes the validity of the tools. Uh, please don't go there for now. Don't go there. Uh, I know some 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 young men uh, in their foolishness uh, during circumcision, where I come from, uh, you find they have run away foolishly and they say they want to be circumcised. Yeah, but you know, circumcision is not just removing the foreskin. Uh, there are certain initiation values that we want you to get through. Now, the types, survey types. We have descriptive or explanatory. Um, I just want to know how many are beginning to to enjoy the niceties of research. When you see this word, and please uh, uh, just lift up your hand and tell me when you see that word, uh, what, what goes through your mind? That service can be descriptive or explanatory. Where are we? What what uh, strategic paradigm are we sitting in? Just looking at that. So so I expect my students, you know, uh, as 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 uh, we are going on. I expect my students to, to link what we have covered. Explanatory, exploratory. What, what can you say? What comment can you give on that? Which paradigm are these, are these things springing from? Which paradigm? Where are we springing from? I was looking for something here. Mm, so I'll leave a big question mark there. And uh, you will let me know. What am I trying to suggest? Surveys also involve entire populations or samples of populations. So, again, a good student of research, when, when, when they see entire population, 
eh, as a student of research, when you see entire population or samples of population, uh, you should be asking yourself, what is going on here? Uh, what is going on? Where well, you're looking at entire populations or samples of populations. You should be courageous at this level to start to say, yes, surveys can involve qualitative because we deal with small populations and sometimes the population is our sample. But when I see samples of populations, then I know sampling has taken place and we are definitely dealing with very large populations and therefore we are inclined towards quantitative analysis. Surveys can capture a moment, capture a moment. And uh, please note, um, this is not just language. Surveys can capture a moment. And uh, you should be asking yourself, what does that mean? Uh, you'll come across this one. Uh, your survey form will be cross-sectional. When you capture a moment, you walk into a children's home and you collect data and walk out. Or they can map trends. I expect you now to begin to know Maybe Ayiro is talking about longitudinal surveys. Longitudinal surveys. So you can capture longitudinal, that's the spelling, surveys, or you have cross-sectional. So note that for longitudinal surveys, you are working on data collection over a long period of time. Maybe you're looking at a trend in behavior between first years and second years, which means you have to observe that data for that period of time. Uh, from the time they get into first year up to second year, you are mapping trends. So it's a longitudinal study. Or you are capturing a moment, you're walking in and walking out. That is cross-sectional. And they can be administered in a number of ways. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the aspects we have been covering are now beginning to drop in. Kugonga Dirisha, Kugonga Mulango, Kukumbusha ya kwamba, hey, I'm here. How do you do survey construction? How do you do survey construction? So, how, in other words, how do you construct your questionnaires? Already advised that we shall not try to be clever and run to be circumcised. No. Look at what it involves formulating questions and response categories. You will learn about them. We will give you examples in my additional notes. But I'll be very reluctant to release you to try and develop your own questionnaires. Writing up background information and instruction, working through organization and length, determining layout and design. So to develop a questionnaire or a tool, 
um, comes at another level. That's all I'm trying to say. So if I wanted to know, for example, why, by the way, why has maths perpetually continued to perform poorly in schools? For example, there there is a leadership, there's a policy issue there. Uh, at the same time, it says the most S is the same maths in most schools. So you'll find a school has 45 E's out of 100 students, but they have 12 S. And then during our time, when I was a principal at Sunshine, the girls made us sweat. The girls of precious blood. So the, the notion that girls can't do maths was shattered at Precious Blood Liruta. And uh, they, they beat us for the years I was the principal at Sunshine in maths. But of course we beat them in chemistry and, and other sciences. And so you see, when you are developing a questionnaire, uh, there is a lot of background information and instruction that you need to know. And what kind of questions are you formulating? So if you walk to a school and you're asking them, uh, explain to me why maths is done poorly. I mean, what are you asking? But I can walk into a school and attitude. You see, now I'm getting insight. There's something I'm looking for. The attitude, I can look at the load the teachers are carrying. I can look at, I can look at, uh, Otieno, you are you at precious blood. Okay, all right, okay. I give you the, the credit. I submit. But, um, I, I, I can listen, I can in looking at the problem of maths, I can look for questions about the role of the principal. Hey, the teachers who are on, in this space. The role of the principal in the propagation of the philosophy of maths in a school. So, you know, I've had principals, when I mentor most of these schools, principals, you go there and you're on parade and they're saying, me, I don't know what I'll do with this, you boys or girls. I don't know what, you, what, what you're going to do. Your performance in maths is terrible. I'm ashamed of you. When you see a school get... 10 A's in maths and 70 E's. It is not the problem of the maths teachers. It's the problem of the leadership in that school. The principal getting into curriculum instruction and implementation to give leadership. The leadership, the principal calling parents to support the school in ensuring that every student has a textbook of maths, has the tables, mathematical tables, has a geometrical set, and that they must use them. Those are the things that if the school is generating some A's and A minus and B plus in maths and generating so many E's so that maths is the most poorly performed subject. It has nothing to do with the maths teachers. It is a leadership policy culture issue. And I'm just being deliberate.
culture issue. And the culture here is the culture of the principle. Huh? So we are talking about leadership. It is the culture of the principle. Uh, the culture. That principal who has come to that school. What is the culture of the principal vis-a-vis -vis academic instruction? Because culture eats strategy for breakfast. So even if you go to Precious Blood and you get the math teacher there and they come to your school and she starts saying, you know, we're going to have quizzes, we're going to do what? We're going to teach the weak class students. We're going to have clinics. The culture in that school will eat that strategy for breakfast. And then we shall start saying, I kira a little precious blood happen. I want to pause there for a moment as we internalize surveys is there any who has an observation i'm being yes boys how are you uh prof i'm well thank you yes yes I, I'm, en I'm, en I'm enjoying the the lesson thank you yes and uh, but then uh, i'm getting more and more scared also why? Because uh, the approach you've taken, which is actually enabling me to look at things very differently, yes. is pointing at something uh, akin to having somebody more knowledgeable in an area mm. where he or she wants to conduct the research. Yes. For example, the explanation you are giving of somebody going to uh, to, uh, to to explore uh, mm. uh, why the performance of maths is at its uh, lowest level, mm. and indeed, I think when when you gave the example of uh, <laughs> somebody writing in the questionnaire that I want mm. to go and ask why uh, the performance is in maths is slow. Yeah. Uh, you're saying that that is a wrong uh, question. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking at it for somebody who has completely no idea what it takes to enable the students understand maths and mm. then uh, also do well, because you may mm. understand it, but also then fail to perform when it is read it. Mm -hmm. uh, are you challenging us that then it means one really need to be very sure with the focus of the area that they want to undertake research in? Yes. Very good. I, I'm yeah. saying this, and then I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, first of all, you must have passion around the area. You must be distressed you can't be distressed if you don't understand an area. And you must be prepared to dig deep through literature review and looking at other studies to enable you to decide which are the variables I'm going to chase in that situation. I tell my students, both at master's and PhD, I don't want to see broad titles like, you know, uh, an evaluation of the 844 system. What are you talking about? There are so many aspects in the 844 phenomenon. You must tease out a very small area where now you can go in depth and bring out knowledge that is not obvious. And that will be reflected in the type of tools that uh, you then bring out. 
in your questionnaire. For example, if you are doing, uh, if you are doing uh, a study, I'm just I'm, and and I really want to be very particular. If you are doing a study on the wellness of a school, the wellness of a school. Uh, what aspect of wellness? Today, the way we are looking at schools, people want to look at the results from a school. And they, they equate that to wellness of a school. No, you have to look at other aspects of a school. Culture of hygiene in a school. And how does it affect the product out of that school? I went to a school in Nyanza um, to mentor. One of my friends was a principal there. There were two schools. Uh, one is a girl's school, the other is a boy's school. And this school had 1,000, and I'm being very precise, 1,463 students. Boarding school against 11 bathrooms. Where before water was an uncertainty, but now we had brought, they had brought a water, a borehole, and they were pumping water, but against 11 bathrooms. Those are, those are things that a study would have to be conducted and the implications of that, the hygiene of a school. I went to another school in Bungoma, a girls' school, and uh, I asked, where are the washrooms? And we were with the uh, Priscilla Were, she's now retired. So we were shown the my the gents and the ladies. I saw we were running away from the entry to the gents. Now people are going behind the wall of the toilets. And when Were went there, she came back and she asked for the keys to drive out of that school to go to the local market and look for a hotel, then come back. You know, those, those, uh, and and, uh, and I really like the comment you, you brought up, because those are the things that you can now structurally develop a research area and do a survey that will then give us results that will be impactful. I'm just using that as an example. Today, the case of 100% uh, transition, I don't know what that means. It's like saying you want 100% training of doctors in Kenya. I mean, it's ridiculous. And then you have schools of 70 students in a class, 80 students in a class. You know, those are variables that just that aspect alone of large classes. Don't you see problems of mental health? Don't you see problems of hygiene when boys are sleeping in triple deckers in packed dormitories? The other day I saw a picture of a dormitory that was raised down. You get scared. So when you're going to construct the questionnaire, you then have to be very keen in that area and look for a small niche for yourself, as it were. Yes. Any other comments? And uh, then we proceed on. I'm 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 causing caution around survey construction. Oh, but dear. Uh, yes. Uh, or oh, in that same spirit uh, about uh, constructing um, a survey, uh, and from what uh, uh, you uh, just stated about uh, 
learning from uh, the existent uh, knowledge, I would want to put out the following question. Yeah. I have identified my the population mm -hmm. and uh, I have the rough idea of uh, what I would really want to work on. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, my issue is this uh, about the survey. Um, uh, my research will be uh, conducted in our French-speaking country, yeah. and uh, maybe the literature review of the, that um, uh, um, I'm I've lost you. Please come back again. Yes, I, I'm saying you, you do your research in a French-speaking country. Yes. Yes, sir. and um, uh, the literature review that I've done, okay, or, and also the papers that I'm reading. Uh, from the surveys, uh, I mean, from uh, the structure and the design, um, yeah. nobody has designed uh, maybe a survey or a questionnaire that mm -hmm. um, that uh, is um, duolingo, duolingo uh, oriented. Mm -hmm. So now, mm -hmm. in my case, uh, what do you mm -hmm. think would be my limitations or how can that uh, impact the fact that I'm reading um, uh, like um, uh, the reviews, uh, from uh, that have been conducted, the research that have been conducted in an uh, Anglophone country, but now yeah. I'm doing my research in a Francophone country. Yeah, uh, and and that is a real, real worry for me. Uh, and somebody like you, uh, I would be asking you, which language are you comfortable with? If you are comfortable in French, you can write your thesis in French and get the validated tools done in the French language. And then we will agree at what point would we have the thesis translated. But if you are bilingual strongly, uh, and I can sense it, you, your English is, is well above average, you should be able to walk with the what we call construct validity of the instrument does the instrument measure what it is supposed to measure so at every point in time you'll be getting to get the literal translation to make sure that that is so otherwise i agree with you you're walking into a very slippery and treacherous path and that's why universities uh, would allow somebody to do that thesis in French and then uh, facilitate its translation into English. Uh, that is not a problem. Yeah. Uh, I saw some hands up. Who are those? Any other input? Obadia, you're still, your hand is still up? Is there any other comment on the questionnaire? Yes, Taslin. Good evening, Prof. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, I, I I I agree with what you're saying that we are not yet ready for like constructing um, survey questions because I've done several surveys and if you look at how they are made, sometimes I even wonder like how did this person even think about this because uh, there was this survey that I did last year on uh, teenagers and uh, their knowledge on sexual and productive health and rights and I realized that the topic or the questions that they were being asked was not just around that, but they were going all the way. And sometimes they, they could even be asked like mm -hmm. wrong questions and just see their reaction. So I, I, I agree that maybe we are not yet ready, but so when, 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 when will we be ready and how are we, is there someone who's going to teach us how to come up with these questions or it's just through maturity and continue, learn, continue, uh, continue learning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that openness. That's that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that 
we will not have you attempt to write tools. We will. But I'll be very nervous for you to then carry that tool to the field. Uh, uh, extracts from my chapters on, on how to construct a tool. But you begin to build from there so that, by the way, I, I, I'm submitting to you, even me at my PhD level, I used validated tools. I never, never developed the tools. I read around the subject. I looked at various theses. And then I adapted the tools. And then your results are valid. You see, then if, if you look at, if you, if you go to Google Scholar, this, this paper I wrote about the emotional intelligence of principles, that's why it's getting so highly cited. People will not cite that paper if the data analysis, the survey, the data analysis was not valid. Yeah, so we will learn, but I'm saying, uh, see, lazima tungoje hive, hiyo, hiyo skill, lazima tungoje hive, and then we can say that. I must submit there are many of us, even at this level, who cannot construct a tool that will, will meet the threshold. Uh, is there somebody else? Uh, any co other comment? All right. Yes, uh, Othello. Thank you, Prof. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Uh, one of the things, Prof, that I find very difficult is that sometimes people make, uh, they construct questionnaire and leave a lot of uh, open-ended questions and many people don't have the time to fill in those questions. Sometimes people don't get all the questionnaire what they're looking for, they don't get yeah. the questionnaire back. And so Prof, I would be very interested in when we get to that point to mm. actually help us to construct questionnaire that will be yeah. easy to answer and not waste people's time and that people don't mm. return the questionnaire paper. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you see, you, you know why people, open-ended questionnaires are very easy to construct, but very difficult to analyze. So you are just postponing the inevitable. And we, we will get into that. So let's, let's move a little faster. But please remember this one. Remember this one. Uh, culture. Very important. Now, interviewing uh, as a form of uh, data collection. So there are surveys, and then there is interviewing. Interviewing involves asking the respondents a series of, of open-ended questions. Uh, you interview, and then you lead somebody to continue explaining and you go around the gray areas. And interviews can generate both standardized quantifiable data and more in-depth qualitative data. So please note that we use interviews for both quantitative and qualitative data. However, the complexities of people and the complexities of communication can create many opportunities for miscommunication and misinterpretation. I advise my students to usually to leave the interviews to the last objective in your proposal. The last objective and and unnecessarily like you have bought a new car and you want to drive around Kenya when you are interviewing be judicious 
and contain yourself because you're going to have a lot of complicated material which will be which will, could constitute miscommunication or which will give you a, a big problem when you're trying to interpret that information. There are the following interview types, formal to informal, structured to unstructured, and can be one on one or involved groups. So note that interviews, many people want to fall here, under structured or unstructured. And you can have a formal interview or you can have conversation. And it can be between you and the interviewer or it can involve several groups. When conducting your interviews, you will need to question, prompt, and probe in ways that help you gather rich data. You're looking for rich data. You're looking for unique data. Actively listen and make use of what is being said. And you must manage the overall process. So I've talked about surveys as a form of data collection. We have talked about interviews. And now we're talking about observation. And this observation relies on the researcher's ability to gather data through your senses. And you are able to document actual behavior rather than responses related to behavior. So you can just go to a place and uh, make your observations. And uh, be very careful that uh, the observed can act differently when this word relates to surveillance, when they... So be careful. And uh, sometimes observations can be tainted by an observer's world view. So imagine a brother of mine from Central Province. My best man was uh, Muryuki from Central Province. Imagine a best man going to Nyanza from Central Province. I'm not a best man. A brother from Muranga, Karatina, married from Homa Bay. And then there is uh, a funeral in the home. And uh, there is the phenomenon of Teroburu, for example. His observations will be tainted, if he was researching on it, by his world view. Yeah. And if it is a Muzungu, it is even worse. So observation has that limitation. Types of observation, they range from non-participant to participant, candid or covert, and from structured to unstructured. I think just know that one way of data collection is by observation, is by interview is by survey. Now, the observation process sometimes is treated casually, but it is a method that needs to be treated as rigorously as any other. And so you should do a lot of planning, observing, recording, reflecting, and then authenticating what you have observed. So when you come to our place in Northrift, 
and you're invited to a wedding function like Koito, uh, that requires, if you're going to do research around there, some cultural practices and whether those practices can be institutionalized and a policy developed around them or what is the level of leadership in those things, you have to do, it, it's a rigorous process. You must plan, you must observe, record, reflect, and authenticate. What does it mean in a koito function when the parents of the girl are insisting on certain deliverables? And is that the norm? So you have to authenticate those observations. Another form of data collection is experimentation. And in experiments, we look at cause and effect. Experimentation uh, explores cause and effect relationships by in manipulating the independent variables in order to see if there's a corresponding effect on the dependent variables. So you can see what we have come through is again beginning to reappear uh, dependent and independent variable. And I know there's somebody in this class, my spirit tells me, who is wondering now, which one was the independent? Hmm? Independent or dependent? No, it can't have been. The dependent, was the dependent the outcome? Or was the independent the stimulus? If you are doing that, that is good. You are thinking and you are worried. Uh, pure experimentation requires both a controlled environment and the use of randomly assigned control group. Again, you can see aspects we have talked about. Randomness uh, increases the validity. And then controlled environment. So go to Kisumu Boys. Uh, have two textbooks. One class would use the Shiwani maths textbook. The other one would use the Patel. And the other one will have, will be the control. They will not have these new additions. Maybe they're just using the KLB. Then you observe. And this is now you map over a long period, longitudinal study. Uh, experimental experimentation can be difficult to achieve in human-centered experiments conducted in the real world. You can't confine human subjects to certain environments, so it becomes very difficult to control. Real-world experiments, they are many experiments that can only be carried out in the messy and controlled environments of the real world. So the search for cause and effect will require trade-offs between real world context and a controlled environment. So what are we saying? That uh, it is very hard to get uh, a high level of validity when you are doing experiments in a real world situation. And therefore, there is always a threshold where we say, if the result ranges in this region, if the level of significance is in this region, then it is acceptable. So the reality comes in. There are advantages of questionnaire surveys and disadvantages. Uh, I would like to spend some time on these ones. Although my font is small, but I would like to spend some time on these ones because that is what somebody was asking. How do we know then what we are going to choose? So let me try and see whether we can magnify this a little bit. Let's see. Sorry.
questionei essa vez. Um... Yeah, um... Look at the advantages. Survey is quick and easy to administer. Can get a large amount of information in a short time. Walk into a school. The teachers are in the staff room. Give them a questionnaire. After one hour, you get it back. Allows for employee participation. Does not require a trained interviewer. And relatively less expensive. The disadvantages, the quality of information related to the quality of the questionnaire. And this is what I was arguing, the quality of the questionnaire. Uh, so, you know, the, the quality of the information is actually a function of, sorry, is a function of the quality of the questionnaire. So if the questionnaire is garbage in, you get garbage out. So the quality of information is a function of the quality of the questionnaire. Must have high school reading and writing ability to complete one. In other words, you must be very proficient. Often needs follow-up interview or observation. Uh, this, this is not maybe, this is, it is difficult to construct. It's not maybe, very difficult to construct. So don't hallucinate about that. Somebody mentioned may have a low response rate. Responses may be incomplete. People are tired. Particularly if, the, if it's the headmaster who introduced you and they don't like the headmaster. If it's the headmaster took you to the staff room. Or then you have very low response. They will not bother to complete. But if you went there with the headmaster they like, then it will be finished. And then this one, be careful. Responses may be difficult to interpret. And we have already hinted to this. Open-ended. Very dangerous. Very easy to, 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 to write, to construct, to design. But... Hard to interpret. Online questionnaire, the use of an internet, of the internet has made a huge difference. Uh, we do it a lot with the Google questionnaires. We get responses immediately, even in this course. Uh, quick to implement, lower cost, and uh, higher responses uh, when you are using online questionnaires. So th those are the, the advantages. Face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Effective method for qualitative data collection. Face-to-face -face interviews. Because the human interaction of face-to-face -face interviews provides the opportunity to probe, to probe for insights and build on responses. Door-to-door, uh, -door, door. people are contacted at home and in person. Street, shop mall intercepts, very difficult. You get very rude people. Uh, and some people consider it a nuisance. And then, of course, telephone interviews. Uh, many people do their interviews by telephone to collect data and even to look for jobs. And then finally, web-based questionnaires. Uh, a new and inevitable, inevitably growing methodology is the use of internet-based research. You get uh, an email, you respond to it, and then computer-assisted personal interviewing is a, a form of personal interviewing, but instead of completing a questionnaire, the interviewer brings along a laptop or a handheld computer to enter the information directly from the database. Uh, so there, there are many ways uh, to, to collect data. And I hope I have uh, opened up your mind 
to note uh, the various aspects of data collection. We want to have an interlude uh, so that I can hear our comments on this. Interlude, yeah. Uh, Manyara Charles, then Othello. Othello. Oh, my hand went up by mistake. <laughs> uh, I wanted to Manyara. ask, I was looking at the, the questionnaire. The yeah. disadvantages are many there than the advantages. And then I was wondering, is it uh, then? Is it advantage? What is the advantage of using it if the disadvantages are many than the advantages? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think what you what you know what you need to note is that uh, this this is where you are being rigorous and keen as a researcher can squeeze these disadvantages out of this space. So this is this is like giving you the signs there's a, a danger ahead. And so when you are doing your questionnaire, you want a quality questionnaire. So what does that mean? And it means you will not mm -hmm. try to consult your own questionnaire. It means you're going to go and download a questionnaire that is validated in that area. Um, this one may be difficult to construct. We can overcome this. Okay. May have low response rates. May have. So how do you overcome that? So for me, I, 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 I would say those are challenges that when you overcome them, then you end up with a questionnaire that is more valid. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other observation on this? Because, ladies and gentlemen, in a week's time, we shall start doing our proposal, the, the, the first elements of our proposal. And it runs from chapter one, chapter two, this is chapter three where we are looking at the data analysis, data collection and data analysis. No, we are looking at the methodology, the survey designs, I mean, the sampling designs, and then data collection and data analysis. Yeah. Any other question, observation, comment? Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wanted to find out if, uh, for example, if you are doing pre-testing, can it help you to redesign your questionnaire? You are just doing pre-testing to see how this questionnaire is understood by the informant, the people you want to interview. You do a pre-testing to test the, the, the good, good question. Um, that what you are calling pre-testing is this one is on slide seventy-one. Effective piloting. Yeah. So when you go and pilot, you begin to see ambiguity. You begin to see the length. You begin to be discouraged by open-ended questions. You get. And so that pretest then allows you to come out and engage in weighed modification of the tool. So that's the piloting aspect. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, 10 minutes break, and then we resume. We are now, uh, it's now coming to 7.30. We end at 8.30, so let's take a break as I assemble the material for your reading. 10 minutes sharp.
Gott. Welcome us back. Um, and uh, we're now going to our summary section on data collection, uh, methods of data collection. Very, very important for me. And after we've done data collection, I will cover uh, very uh, briefly, uh, ethical issues in research. Uh, I will uh, come in back into data analysis when we are doing the actual proposals, and I'll build on what uh, Dr. Chesang is covering in the statistics related to actual research. Uh, as we begin now to start uh, proposed. So I want between now and next week, we shall now be ready to start our topic. Uh, and uh, I'm aware of what Carol and the team are doing. So we'll um, bridge those two courses uh, and call it disciplined inquiry or call it thesis preparation. But now it's disciplined inquiry because we are going to go into your areas, depending on your field. Uh, and now try to get you interested, try to get a supervisor with a speciality in the area you want to go, uh, to begin to entice and give you people who can start uh, working with you. Uh, uh, chapter one, chapter one starts with a topic and the whole of introduction of chapter one. Then we go to chapter two, then chapter three. By the time we finish, uh, many of you should be able to say, "Want to? I want to come and present my proposal uh, online or physically." But that those details we'll get into later. Um, so allow me to uh, share uh, some notes from my book, and uh, somebody was asking me when about i have no idea because this book i think because of the the junior secondary program uh my publishers klb are taking a long time uh but uh, it will come out anytime but meanwhile you are lucky because you're getting materials from the same book so we'll be able to see uh, this as we go along um and when I'm doing summary like this, ni sio kuchemsho bongo, lakini ni kujaribu kumweka katika hali ya uzoefu kwa mambo ya utafiti, desturi ya utafiti, tabia ya utafiti, na mienendo za utafiti, ambazo ningependa nini nyote, mustahamili, na muwe watu ambao wakati sisi tunastaafu wengine wenu mtakuwa pahali niko sasa mkifunza mambo ya research methods so the, my objective was uh, uh, for you to understand the different kinds of data collection strategies 
uh, data collection strategies. Um, asante sana wale wengine wanafikiri mwalimu wa kemia hajui Kiswahili. Wengine wana wanaweka alama ya mshangao. Uh, wengine naona wanaweka alama ya <laughs> duku duku na wengine na kadhalika lakini unajua mimi ni ni kijana ambaye ni kijana wa wa mtaa wa kibera understanding the different kinds of data collection uh, you must differentiate it's readers course is a book but this is a class uh maybe i could even do that uh, um, the objectives that uh, i don't want to use the word learner but you are a reader so you'll be able to differentiate between the kinds of data collection strategies recognize the strength and limitations of conducting surveys note we have looked at surveys we have looked at interviews we have looked at observation. There is also document collection and focus group discussions, which I'll want to come to when I'm teaching you now at your discipline level, where you'll assemble people with the same uh, interest to collect uh, data from for your study. And it's important to note that your selected data sources may have information in terms of variety, uniqueness, and volume. However, your role is not to collect any kind of data they can provide, but extract the type of data you need to meet the purpose of your study and address the research questions you have. I think this is very significant. Unajua, uh, mkusanyiko wa data, uh, haukupi habari yoyote. Itazidi uchanue, upige msasa, na uchambue yala mbayo ya namahana, uh, na yanalingana na hali ambapo unataka kufanya utafiti so this is where you must think about a tool that can be used or could be used to effectively and efficiently generate the information you need for your study note there is the notion most students don't get there's a difference between data and information so you'll be exposed to a lot of data, but you've got to tease out and bring out the information that is relevant to the purpose, must be relevant to the purpose of the study, purpose of your study, and it must also be relevant to the research questions. I hope you are taking notes of that. So, um, so you'll get heaps volumes, variety, uniqueness, but remember your purpose of your study and your research questions. And so you must have a way, a tool that will efficiently and effectively generate the information you need for your study. And there are a lot of innovative data collection strategies that could use, uh, but there's a limit uh, in this discussion to the common, commonly used ones. And uh, remember, testing, survey, interview, focus group, document collection, and observation. Uh, this is a book uh, that you refer to. But testing is experimentation. I hope you know that. But we have gone through all this. I have left out focus group discussions because we will now use it when you are actually working on your own document. Now, testing method, you read through these notes. 
uh, and and know how you will test uh, through experimentation. Uh, because when you're assessing, like assessment of participants' ability, knowledge, skills, capability, uh, you'll have to know how you will do it. Now, if you plan to conduct a test, make sure the instrument is validated. Uh, validated. And that's why I was saying, don't you search, why don't you uh, stay with your supervisor so that they can help you get validated instruments. Then you can modify them, adapt them to your situation. And there are certain statistical tests that have been done on those instruments. And if they meet a certain threshold, then you can use them. Uh, so you see, a validated instrument is a measure that has been used to test a population similar to the one you're focusing on. And uh, in addition, I like this. The tool should have acceptable validity and acceptable, acceptable validity and reliability outcomes. If there's no available instrument to help measure what you plan to measure, then you can consider developing your own tool and if possible, use your study to validate it. This is complicated. Uh, methods of data collection. Uh, I think I've gone through them, but there is a quantitative data collection methods. Uh, a good student should say, oh, this is, this is explanatory, quantitative. So look at this part and uh, our parents used to tell us why should you bother uh going to the shamba when you have so many children brenda king are you there brenda Hi, Prof. Yes, I'm here. A bit in a noisy place, but I'm here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Caroline, Caroline? Caroline, are you there? Yes, I'm available. Are you able to read or you're in a social place? No. Okay. Okay. Read us about qualitative data collection methods. Can I read it? Quantitative data collection is a method of data collection that focuses on measurement. When researchers choose quantitative data collection, they are contemplating the implementation of numerical research analysis. Quantitative research methods are concerned with collecting and analyzing data that is structured and can be represented numerically. Quantitative data collection is based on the concept of building accurate and reliable measurements that allow for statistical analysis. The objective is to focus on quantifiable measurements. Quantitative research is defined as research that address research objectives through empirical assessments that involve numerical measurement and analysis approaches. David yes. and Zygman, 2008. So, quantitative data collection measurement. Numerical measurement. Carry on. Surveys and questionnaires. The survey is a data collection strategy used to capture or measure people's opinions, thoughts, and or experience of a phenomenon. In a quantitative study, a survey is used to measure a specific variable or a group of variables. 
It normally consists of closed-ended questions accompanied with answers to choose from. For example, a researcher could ask, do you consider yourself to be an entrepreneur? And provide the following options. A, yes. B, no. C, not sure. Besides this, a survey could contain statements with Likert scale responses. For example, a statement such as, I feel nervous when I'm about to speak to a group, could have a Likert scale option such as, A, strongly disagree, B, disagree, C, unsure, D, agree, E, strongly agree. We also have a survey containing open-ended questions. This data collection tool is usually used when conducting a qualitative study. Qualitative researchers opt for administering an open-ended survey when working with limited resources and time or targeting a large sample of participants who are not willing to be interviewed. That's by her and Sash 2003. Here are a few examples of open-ended survey questions. One, what do you feel when, what do you do when you feel burnout? How do you feel about working on your dissertation? What do you do when you subordinate, when your subordinate is reluctant to work? Okay, pause there, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I want Frank or Chana, are you there? Frank? Yes, I'm there. Good, pick it up from there. Remember, we are now summarizing what we were doing in the last two lectures. Yes. Because you will not be there to ask follow-up questions, it is important to make sure you create simple questions and ask reasons why you should have. Uh, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'll repeat. Because you will not be there to ask follow-up questions, it is important to make sure you create <laughs> simple questions and ask one question at a time. Also, some participants may skip the questions, and this one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons why you should have a larger sample size compared to when conducting interviews. By so doing, you will get substantial data, even if not all the participants addressed all the questions. Yes. Uh, carry on. Uh, sorry, sorry. Somebody has raised the sound. Uh, yeah, Prof, um, if you would go back to that paragraph, yes, uh, just read, just about, yes. <clears throat> so um, I think it's very important to ask follow-up questions because they they kind of uh, help one understand the answer somebody really, or what really someone was talking about. But the second part of that first sentence it is important to uh, to make sure you create simple questions and ask one question at a time. Yeah. I'm a little bit conflicted. I don't find that second part of the sentence answering or providing a solution to not being there to ask follow-up questions. Even though I've seen questionnaires which say, if, mm. if you say yes, I know yeah. questionnaires should be open-ended. If you say mm. yes, why? If you say mm. no, why not? Mm. And maybe, what's your take on that? Why you, why you are uh, urged to have follow-up questions? Uh, that happens when your questions are not clear. They are ambiguous. That's why I'm saying here, it is important to make sure you create simple questions ah, that, okay. will, mm -hmm. that will clean out ambiguity. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. I, that I, makes sense. Some, people, some people have what we call double barrel or triple mm -hmm. barrel questions. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them, you only need one bullet to kill somebody. Why are you shooting three bullets in the same heart? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. I'm happy we're thinking good, that. Got it. Got that it. Got it. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, the reader. Okay. Surveys are one of the key methods in terms of quantitative data collection. That is according to Alessi and Martin 2010. A survey is a system for collecting information on a range of topics, including health education, psychology, law, and etc. Of which the main characteristics are that data are collected, <coughs> are that data are, are collected from a number of individuals using a systematic and standardized approach. For example, questionnaires, stroke structured interview schedule, stroke scales or tests, and that these individuals are representative sample of the population under study, according to Meadows 2008. Uh, thank you very much. Very good reading. Uh, who said Vivian Kimadi? Are you, you online, Vivian? Vivian, are you online or you've gone shopping? Uh, I'm online, Prof. Okay. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So can we carry on with the reading? We're just summarizing. Yes. yes. Um, there, there are three fundamental types of survey that are, really, are popular with social investigators, factual attitude and explanatory. Uh, the factual survey is used just, to collect. Just pause. I just pause a minute right. <laughs> and tell me factual attitude and explanatory. Um, what what is this type of survey? I keep asking this question, and I know why. Anybody? If we don't answer, I'll simply be putting their question mark and we move. Prof, if I may attempt. May I? Yes, please, go ahead. Um, okay, thanks. Oh, Boaz, you've... Uh, okay, yes, Boaz, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, my dear. Go ahead, my dear. Okay, you know, you boys, you are given a lot of chances. Leave us now to take it over. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. But Prof, I, I want to attempt it just from the point of view of the semantics of them that probably a factual one will elicit responses that can be tested and or are objective, you know. Mm -hmm. On attitude, uh, I have a feeling it brings about elements of opinion and feelings that folks may have on a subject matter. And finally, on an explanatory one, uh, mm. essentially a deduction of a phenomena from the point of view of the interviewee. Uh, my take, I may be wrong, over to you. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is good. But please remember, Explanatory is about hypothesis testing and establishing the validity of theories. It's about it's about quantitative. It's about um, 
proving a theory, rejecting or upholding a hypothesis. So let's let's bear this in mind as we go on. Carry on. Is it Terry? Yeah. The factual survey is used to collect. So, so, so just a minute. Okay. Ellen Gashanga, qualitative wrong. Juliana Magomere, qualitative wrong. Yeah. ETC. Uh, Ruth, I can see factual is quantitative. So please uh, let us note that as we move along. Carry on. Yeah. The factual survey is used to collect descriptive inform information about a population of people. The national population census of any country falls within this category of survey. <clears throat> the factual survey can be used to investigate the sociological problems of a specific population of people. Ahmad, 2018. Uh, the attitude survey is designed to investigate the subjective stance of ind individuals on events, issues, and trends. A typical example of an attitude survey is opinion polling on political issues and events such as elections, voting patterns, and government's policies and activities. Market research that is conducted to know consumers' attitudes towards products also belongs to this category of survey, AMAD 2018. Lastly, the explanatory survey is the most sophisticated and most comprehensive in that it takes an inquiry beyond description. It is a survey that involves theory development through hypothesis testing. It is also the survey type <clears throat> that is used to test the validity of existing theories and to generate new hypotheses from such theories in order to examine patterns of statistical correlation among variables. A typical example of an explanatory survey is a study conducted purposively to know why a section of a community prefers to vote for a particular candidate, candidate in, an, in an election, AMAD 2018. Okay, thank you very much. Very good reading, Terry. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, surveys from the PowerPoint, which you're going to get, are now the notes, the consolidating notes, which should be offering explanation. Uh, I would like uh, Boaz to pick up from their quantitative observations. Uh, thank you, Prof. Allow me to ignore um, my brother Madian for the moment. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> thank you. It's called sibling rivalry. Uh, quantitative observations. A quantitative data collection method that focuses on observational assessment is a direct observation. See table 14.1. A direct observation is an observational assessment that produces detailed records of what people actually do during an event. The researcher is responsible for recording the behavior of the, of the subjects with observational assessment as a measurement approach. The researcher plays a passive role, making no attempt to control or to manipulate a situation, instead merely recording what occurs. The researcher assesses the, the subjects in the observation, then records and scores the assessment. Every effort is made for the researcher not to insert himself or herself into the situation, as per uh, Bebin, Bebin and Zygmunt, 2008. In, in this method, researchers collect quantitative data through systematic observations by using techniques such as 
counting the number of people present at a specific event at a particular time and a particular venue or the number of people attending an event in a designated place. More often, for quantitative data collection, researchers have a naturalistic, sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go on. Yes, more often for quantitative data collection, researchers have a naturalistic observation approach that needs keen observation skills and senses for getting the numerical data about the what and not the why and how, as per Calderon et al. 2000. I just paused there. Uh, you see, you are just, you are collecting data about the what is happening. You don't go into the why trying to seek interpretation and inference or the how they are doing this process compared to those other people. So it is the what, and the what is the simplest aspect of research in observation. You note that later on in qualitative studies, the why and the how become very important. Uh, and, and I want us to get a deeper understanding of this. I wish I had time. But uh, there are two laptops. One is an HP or Lenovo. The other one is a Mac laptop. The what they do is the same. They are computers. They are data processors so the what they do is the same that's why observation is the simplest form of data collection the how they do it begins to differ how an hp manipulates or the processes you engage in when you're using an hp to access a certain software is very different when you're using a mac the how begins to bring variation. But the why is what is critical. Why do people buy a mark for 200,000 Kenya shillings and then pay for an HP 30,000? The other day, one of you was telling me, you know, I bought a laptop. I was very excited. So I asked how much. Yes, the what and the how, perhaps, but the what is the same, it's a computer. The how is different. So why do people pay this extra 100,000 100, K for a mark? It is the why. Uh, why? So this Mac computer is uh, resistant to virus attack, for example. Yeah, it has, um, uh, you know, it has certain smooth edges. Those of you believe in aesthetics, somebody will say, what does it matter? Whether it is a smooth edge or a rough one like uh, Toshiba, what does it matter? Uh, I'm saying something, even with this data collection the depth at which you want to go will bring you out as an intuitive researcher, a serious researcher, or a basic researcher. Carry on. Mm, thank you. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Structured observation is an example of this. In this type of observation method, the researcher has to make careful observations of one or more specific behaviors in a more comprehensive or structured setting compared to naturalistic or particip uh, 
participant observation. In a structured observation, the researchers, rather than observing everything, focus only on very specific behaviors of interest. It allows them to quantify the behaviors they are observing. When the observations require a judgment on the part of the observers, it is often described as coding, which needs a clearly defined set of target behaviors, as per Question Pro 2019. Another example of an observation assessment is recording traffic counts and uh, traffic flows within a supermarket to help managers to design uh, to design store layouts that maximize a typical customer's exposure to the merchandise offered while also facilitating research efforts. Such an observation assessment will also ensure that a manufacturer can then better determine uh, shelf locations, the arrangement of departments and merchandise within those departments, the location of checkout facilities and other characteristics that improve the shopping value that consumers obtain from visiting a store. Still, Question Pro 2019. In this example, data can be more accurately gathered simply by observing customers' movements in a store rather than by asking them about their movements. Wonderful, wonderful. I hope we are picking something. Uh, and Boaz, this, this was my argument. Uh, when you are going out for data collection, what, what are you going to? Uh, are, are you just going to sit outside QuickMart and uh, tell us the number of cars that are coming in and going out? Or do you want to say something that will be practical? Uh, uh, how many of you remember Nakumat with with nostalgia? Uh, Nakumat, uh, not Junction. This Nakumat that used to be here at uh, the Junction to Kibira and then uh, Adam uh, in the Yaya Center. That's Prestige. Nakumat. Prestige. Yeah? Prestige. Prestige. Do you remember how wonderful? I remember. At uh, that time, I was at Sunshine as the principal. You wanted to go to Nakuma because things were so well arranged, movement flow of uh, trolleys, and you knew where the meats were, you know where the sodas were, you knew where uh, merchandise uh, uh, was upstairs. That calls for research, market research. And then I go to to Soy Market, where I live, and there's somebody has a market. It's uh, has written big words, supermarket. Yeah. You know, the 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 normal, I mean the, the local people, they don't have etiquette and courtesy. You know, uh so I hope you're seeing it, structured observation and the benefits. I have problems with uh, when I go every time I go to this uh, quick mat at Valley Arcade, I have problems. Uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they have no interest in customers' convenience and aesthetics. It has everything. So uh, I look at the parking out there and some little parking upstairs. You know, you want customers, you want them to come, but you're not reading the ambience. Uh, come back home in Daystar. I don't know how many of you went to our library at Valley Road. It was, it was a dingy, almost mortuary looking like place. You know? So today go there or come to main campus, to, to, to our library. I'll be inviting all graduate students uh, this semester to come for a day. We just talk uh, research and postgraduate studies. Uh, look at the library. We have refashioned the 
Agape Library at a very big cost for the sake of the customer. And it came through observation. My observation at Agape Library at main campus is that nobody would be in the library. I would go there at six in the morning and the place is, is empty. Seven, eight o'clock, even the workers. Then I asked myself, what, what is it that we need to do as a business student, as an entrepreneur? What is it that I need to do to... to... So I visited the University of Iowa for a, for a training in uh, entrepreneurial management of universities. And I said, we were doing it in the library. I was so ashamed as I looked back to my library in, in North River. We came and we redid that library uh, and produced corporate... Uh, uh, corporate learning, uh, removed those uh, small little dingy tables and put round tables, put sockets on the tables. Uh, we have areas where you can discuss openly in the basement. We have areas where you sit uh, reading privately. The School of Law has its own area of reading. Um, I'm saying something. This comes out of research. And that's why this congregation we have 41 participants, 49 now. I want you to come out with studies that have application to existential realities and problems that we face as a country. Then now your PhD, in fact, even before you graduate, you already have enrolled for your PhD and you just walk through it. Um, we have 10 minutes. And let me just run through, first of all, quantitative interviews. Uh, this, this handout, we are posting it as part of your reading notes. Uh, qualitative focus groups. I don't want to worry about this, but uh, when you're going to interview people, bring them as a group. And then you have discussion. Structured or open end. And uh, you get to get to collect that information. But this is the table, uh, Boaz, that we're talking about. Uh, a research method. And this one I would like, uh, uh, there's somebody here, I've not heard him. Is it, um, he's called Sylvanus Guitare. Uh, if he's on the line, if he's not, then I met somebody at the airport. I can't remember the name. I think they're in this class or my PhD class. I don't know which one. But anyway, we can go to, to either of those two. Those two get ready. So, Gitare, are you there? Gitare? Yes, Dr. Chari. Oh, good. Very good. I had. Shika Kazi. I was, I'm having trouble with my internet. I don't know why oh. I can't see it clearly. Okay, fine. Then let, let me, let's get, uh, Tasleen, are you there? Or oh, you're also having trouble? No, uh, I'm, I'm here. Okay, okay, good. All right. Uh, this is the table that uh, Boaz referred to. So I'll, I'll scroll it. You start. Okay. Uh, qualitative data collection methods. Is it? Quantitative data collection methods, yeah. uh, research methods, characteristics, and examples, surveys and questionnaires. The survey is a data collection strategy used to capture or measure people's opinion. Do I call, okay. Uh, people, people, people's opinion, thoughts, or do I let you start first? No, it's okay. Me, I'm all right. Okay. Thoughts or and and experiences of a phenomenon in a quantitative study, the survey is used to measure a specific variety or a group of variables. It normally consists of close-ended questions. Okay. Let's um, go to the example. Yeah. The national population census of any country falls within this category of survey. The factual survey can be used to investigate the sociological problems of a specific population of people. 
that is by Ahmad 2018. All right. On quantitative, do, do I continue? Yeah. On quantitative observations, a direct observation is an observation assessment that produces detailed record records of what people actually do during an event. The researcher is responsible for recording the behavior of the subjects with uh, observational assessments as a measuring approach. An example of this, uh, an example of this method is counting the uh, the number of customers entering a retail store and observing their behavior. In a structured observation, the researcher, rather than rather than observing everything, focus focus only on every specific, on very specific uh, behavior of interest. It allows them to quantify the behavior, the behaviors they are observing. Carry on. On quantitative interviews. Quantitative interviews involve questions and responses cat categories that are determined in advance. Responses are fixed and respondent respondents choose from among these fixed responses. For an example of this method is recording data from interviews with participants uh, while administering a survey. The survey questions are close-ended as are the participants' responses. Um, quantitative focus groups. The, co the quantitative data collection method takes a quantitative approach. Rather than using quantitative methods, this method administers surveys and questionnaires to focus groups. This method uses quantitative uh, in bracket survey research to, uh, to guide the design of appropriate research protocol. An example of this administration uh, an example of this is administering newly developed or previously validated survey to a group of people who are um, representative of a population. Quantitative focus groups only focus on collecting data from the focus group uh, with a survey or questionnaire. Rather than using qualitative methods, this method administers surveys and questionnaires to focus groups. Thus, the Results of quantitative focus groups are analyzed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good reading. Now, uh, um, I have told you not to worry about the focus groups. We shall uh, elaborate on that when we get into your actual proposals. But it's just a way of bringing people together and asking questions, and you are recording the different responses that they give you. There are advantages and disadvantages. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, then there's the qualitative data collection methods, which we have gone through. And now I'm giving you the notes to consolidate. There's the interview and there'll be examples. Uh, and then there is uh, creating interview questions. Uh, you have uh, research questions, the respective trends and potential interview questions. So you'll have an idea on how to construct these questions. And uh, at the beginning of the next class, I'll give it liberty. This is not an assignment. This is just a reading for yourself. Give me your experiences in, uh, for example, uh, how research questions are developed and what did you find interesting? How do people with a mental health condition deal with mental health stigma? They're just giving you examples of research questions. And then they're giving you the kind of topics that uh, you can generate uh, and then uh, potential interview questions. Now, look at this. Again, I'm going back to what uh, uh, Bo has raised. Look, look at this question. How do people with a mental health condition deal with mental health stigma? It's not a, you don't have a broad, all-carrying Pentecostal topic yeah, what is the problem with mental health? Or how do we deal with mental health? So what type of topic, the kind of mental health related stigma? Stigma. You see, you have narrowed it down. You're not just talking about mental health. You're not talking about stigmatization. So look at the questions. How do you handle 
an experience of discrimination due to your mental health condition? How do you react to an experience of rejection due to mental health? Can you share with me a time when you felt reluctant to disclose your mental health condition due to fear of the negative attitude? How did you cope with that feeling? What strategies do you use to deal with the stigma associated? So you don't just go and say, talk to me about mental health and the challenges and the difficulties you experience. I'm off pass. And then focus group discussions. Uh, there's a write-up. Please read through it. Uh, document collection. Uh, look through that. Uh, observation. Uh, we have dealt with this at length, but go through it to consolidate. And then uh, qualitative data collection methods, interviews, characteristics, example, focus group, observation, document. How to choose an appropriate data collection strategy. I've done some attempts. And then I have a very short summary. And references, I've only given a few. There are actually more than 100. I've just cut this. There are more than 100 references. Uh, why I'm not worried about references is because my librarians are doing a splendid job. So me, I want to see it in your performance. Is it next week or when they finish the topic? But I already have questions on referencing because it is so critical that you understand referencing and why... For example, in this bullet, there is Franklin International Publishers. Why this is a site? Huh? Why this reference from this person? It is social work research known, and there are pages given. This is a journal article. And how do you write it? So I want to see it in the exam. So we'll continue paying attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I really want to appreciate uh, your patience and your understanding while I was away. Uh, I'm going to have three days with you, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, I'll be wrapping up the loose ends in this research area. And then we shall start the discipline inquiry the other week, where you now start working with your own topic. And then uh, you should have no problem. By the time we finish theory, your, your coursework, we shall have our proposals ready for defense. So I'll be keen. Uh, what am I sending you? I'm sending you the PowerPoint presentation. I'm sending you what, as usual, the additional notes. These are not for memorizing, but I'm and then I'll also send you uh, our devotion and legacies today. Uh, any 